online expert home care. Hello and good evening to everyone that's here tonight. Um, I want to thank you all for giving up your nice Tuesday evening with all of us um, to really talk about a topic that I feel is probably one of the most important determinants of your own personal and professional success. So establishing strong networks of mentorship and sponsorship and allyship, these relationships are not only going to help advance you professionally in your career, but also personally in your life and in your social networks and in you as an individual and a person. So tonight I have an amazing panel of speakers that I'm going to introduce in a moment, and we're going to address several main topics. I'd like to go over kind of understanding the benefits of mentorship and sponsorship for you, because I think many of you may not really understand why it's so important for you to have a mentor and have a sponsor and in, in return be one yourself. Um, we're going to talk about where women currently stand in medicine and other fields and what the data shows, consider the obstacles and the barriers to developing these relationships. And finally, we're going to end with, you know, what does successful mentorship and sponsorship look like? And how can men, as well as women, be allies and support women in medicine? Um, so um, I have something you can hold on on my screen, Papa. It's not letting me move my slides. There we go. All right. Here we go. So, you know, if you look at the definition of mentorship, you know, you're going to see first and foremost, this is a relationship you have, okay? Now this definition actually comes from Dr. Brad Johnson and his work, he studied mentoring for over three decades. And I was very lucky to hear him actually speak at the Harvard Women's Leadership Course this past November. But mentorship is dynamic. It's, it, you know, in the best cases, it's gonna be reciprocal where you're getting something out of it as well as your mentor. And when you look at all the data out there on mentoring, you know, much of it from Dr. Johnson, you're gonna see that mentors tend to do very specific things. And what makes mentoring distinctive is that they become these reciprocal relationships. As your mentor, I'm not just interested in developing your career, but also the psychosocial functions of mentoring. You know, mentors check in with you. They see how you're doing. They become more deliberate with bringing you along to see how they execute certain things in the professional domain. You know, and over time, these relationships really become your safe spaces where these relationships become a place to try things, to learn, to grow. And, and many of the best mentorships, they really go on in perpetuity. So even if you don't see your mentor over long periods of time, you know that they're still there in your corner rooting for you and, and there for you. So, so you may wonder, why do you need a mentor? And why are we having this webinar? Why is this so important? But what five decades, perhaps, of research and mentoring uh, has shown across multiple businesses, most multiple specialties, is shown as that can really be slummed up in this one slide is that we find that those that are fortunate enough to have an early career mentor, they do better. They go farther. They have more opportunities presented to them. They have more doors open for them. They have more networks and they tend to feel more confident. People rate them as being more competent. They're loyal to the institutions in which the mentoring occurs. And, you know, another interesting fact for those of you who may be aiming to climb up the academic ladder or, you know, become the next Golden Cystoscope Award winner, there's fascinating research on Nobel Prize winners in the sciences. And half of American Nobel Prize winners, winners have actually been mentored by prior Nobel Prize winners. So, you know, there's this notion that, you know, your successes are my successes with a mentor and that we really pass along our fame through our mentor uh, and our mentee. And we see this in our discipline, too. So for those of you that have a mentor, you really have something special. People that are well-mentored tend to have more resilience. They have more hope. They have a self-efficacy and I can do attitude. They tend to see themselves rising to this level. And there's something about the psychology of someone who has a mentor that, that we see people that don't have a mentor don't express in the same capacity. It's a higher order of psychological capacity. You know, and this was a longitudinal study done that, that, that demonstrated this over thousands of people in multiple different fields. Now, there's no arguing. There are certainly many biases that women face and that are specific to women. You know, the motherhood bias, a bias in how women are evaluated or treated by other staff, um, how behavior is perceived. But irrespective of any of the biases that you can see or that you can collect, there's really one main thing that reigns true, and it's that women have less access and fewer mentors. And when they do have mentors, there's less of a sponsoring component there. So, so we really have a lot of work to do. And 
you know, I, I think when you ask what's sponsorship, you know, I hear all these terms, what are these fancy terms? Well, one of the best ways I like to think of it is it's mentorship. And I heard this term in the Harvard Women Leadership course is that it's sponsorship and mentorship that's linked. So this is essential. It's the element of mentoring where you're creating opportunities. You're opening doors for your mentor. You're putting them on the front stage. You're increasing their visibility and they're talking about you when you're not in the room. So, so what does loud sponsorship look like? And, and I love this slide from Dr. Johnson. It's you're their raving fan. You know, you're giving them a ringing endorsement. You're bringing her to the key meetings. You're putting her name forward. You're nominating her for promotions, for committees, for panels. You're talking about her behind her back. And you know what? You're giving her credit for work in front of others, whether she's there or not. You're involving her on studies that you're doing, on multi-institutional research projects, and you're promoting her. Now, this doesn't always have to look like what you think, but sponsorship can be in many different forms. Here's just a few examples in which people can sponsor people from afar. You know, just on social media, men being allies and supporting you by retweeting and tagging you in posts, by sponsoring and saying, great, congratulations on this person's work. You know, I've been very, very lucky in my career to have some mentors that have made absolutely lasting, impactful differences in my career and in my personal life. And so even if you don't see them every day or you talk to them, you know they're in your corner, they're supporting and they're promoting you. And this is why I think it is so important for you guys to seek out and find a good mentor be a good sponsor, find a good sponsor, and become one yourself to others. And this doesn't have to be, um, you know, a hierarchy. This can be a lateral move. You can help and mentor fellow women and men in the field because when you're all there together, you add more. So it really is my honor and privilege tonight to introduce you to panelists. Um, we're very lucky that we have an amazing group of urologists who are all devoted to their time and energy to mentoring, and they really have a lot of insight to add. So um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker is going to be Dr. Mara Heyman. She's an assistant professor of urology at the University of Washington and our associate program director of the UW Andrology Fellowship. She did a residency training at Loyola University in Chicago and her fellowship at the University of Washington in Andrology. And then this is going to be followed by Dr. Sharita King, who is an associate professor at the Medical College of Georgia and Augusta University and the Augusta VA Medical System. She completed her urology residency at the Medical College of Georgia and her sexual medicine fellowship at San Diego Sexual Medicine under Dr. Erwin Goldstein. And last but not least, we're going to have Dr. Ranjit Ramasamy, who is an associate professor of urology and the director of reproductive urology at the University of Miami in Florida. He completed his urology residency training with my husband at Cornell Medical College in New York Presby Hospital, and he then completed an NIH-sponsored fellowship uh, in male reproductive medicine and surgery at Baylor College of Medicine. And most recently, he was awarded the 2023 Golden Cystoscope Award by the AUA for his efforts in academia, research, and mentorship. So I'm extremely excited to have these panelists with us, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Heyman. Thank you so much, Helen, for the invitation and to the SMSNA for the um, for sponsoring this webinar. I think this is incredibly important information, and I am excited to share. So, um, I was tasked with the responsibility of talking about women in academic medicine and urology, and kind of giving a state of the union. So, how are we doing? So, my disclosures. So, just a brief outline. We'll talk about women in leadership today, the current state of women in urology and then optimizing gender equity in urology. So just broadly, in US politics, academia, and business, women make up a substantial number of the population, but are represented in only very small numbers in leadership. And this crosses boundaries from politics, academia, and business, where we see only 4% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. We need to support women in leadership positions because globalization has led to an increasingly competitive and multicultural environment. Diverse viewpoints at all levels foster critical thinking, creative problem solving, and counteract groupthink. And when women are in more leadership positions, this encourages other women to join at more junior levels. And that's in part because inclusiveness is a sign of commitment to equal opportunity and responsiveness to diverse populations. In other words, organizations that lack a culture of equal opportunity are less able to attract, retain, and motivate the most qualified individuals. So how does this affect our discipline directly? 
Let's look at the latest data from the 2022 AOA census. The percentage of women practicing urologists continues to rise from 7.7% back in 2014 to 11.6% in 2022. So we finally, a few years ago, broke that double digit barrier. In 2022, we saw that close to 72% of women completed fellowships compared to 64% of men. And in terms of practice patterns, women practice in academia almost two times more than men. We, when we look at how we spend our time, we find that women on average work the same number of clinical hours as men, but on average spend more time with our patients. Women are reporting doing research in greater frequent frequency of men at 47% compared to 38% of men. Unfortunately, the leadership positions in urology are not entirely reflective of our membership. In 2016, women only comprised 3% of chairs, 4.5% of vice chairs, 7.9% of division directors, 9.4% of fellowship directors, and 8% of residency directors and only 5% of full professors in urology were women. Of the AUA sectional leadership in the, in the graph on the left, um, you'll see the leadership of each of our AUA sections. And on the graph on the left, you see the Professional American Urology Society executive boards. And you'll see that women marked by the purple bars only make up a minority or none of these leadership positions. And I will say that SMSNA was not represented in this study, um, but the AUA, SUO, SUPU, EUS, SPU, GERS, and SAU were. And so in 2021, the AUA asked urologists about burnout and women urologists were reported experiencing burnout greater than men and their rates of burnout had risen significantly higher since the onset of the pandemic. So back in 2016, women and men reported similar burnout rates at about 35%, whereas compared to 2021, closer to 50% of women reported burnout. So what is driving this burnout and what can we do about it? Well, first things first, uh, female urologists report lower satisfaction in this, in this table, men are on the left and female urologists are on the right. So female urologists reported lower satisfaction with work and life balance compared to their male counterparts. Particularly, less than a quarter of men discussed being dissatisfied or highly dissatisfied with work-life integration, whereas over a third of women felt this dissatisfaction. And importantly, the, what else could be driving this? So importantly, the AUA census from 2022 reported a significant gap in take-home pay for women, now on the left, versus men. So in fact, during key earning years under age 65, you see significant amounts of discrepancy of over $100,000 per year for some age periods. The Medscape Compensation Report for Urologists reports these findings also year after year. And in this JAMA study of fully employed academic positions in the US from 2019 to 2020, starting salary, salary at 10 years of employment, annual salary growth rate, and overall earning potential in the first 10 years of employment were estimated. And in this table, you see the gender differences in post-training starting salary in the dark blue bar and 10 years of employment in the adult uh, surgical subspecialties. What you'll see is that positive values on the x-axis, which all of them are, represent salaries higher for men, and negative values on the x-axis would be representative of higher salary values for women, but you don't see that. And so what you see here is that men start higher and outpace women significantly at 10 years when it comes to pay. And this really comes, um, comes into fruition at 10 years. So the earning potential in the first 10 years of post-training employment by gender is also estimated here. And you see that the graph shows that the, um, the uh, mean earning potential value of the men versus women is in the dark, uh, women being the dark blue versus men in the light blue. There is a, a large discrepancy at 10 years in urology and in all of the rest of the adult surgical subspecialties. So many may be thinking, doesn't this make sense? I mean, women take time off to raise families, right? Well, that actually doesn't account for these, these differences. In, in a study published in the Journal of Urology in 2015, Spencer et al. looked at surveys 
um, answered by uh, 848 urologists regarding job satisfaction and compensation. And what they found a multivariable analysis was that female gender was a significant predictor of lower compensation when controlling for work hours, call frequency, age, practice setting and type, fellowship training, and APP employment. And then using the Doximity Compensation Survey, looking at years 2014 to 2019, these authors found that over the course of a simulated career, male and female physici physicians earned approximately $2 million uh, different. And when they looked at the surgical subspecialties, male surgeons earned approximately $2.5 million more than female surgeons. And when this, this was after adjusting for specialty, years of experience, work hours, practice type, practice location, measures of patient volume and clinical revenue. So all of those things were accounted for and there's still a significant gender disparity in pay. We also see significant gender disparities achieving promotions. And this plays into sort of the work satisfaction and burnout that I discussed. So after adjusting for number of publications, amount of grant support, 10 year number of hours worked in specialty, women are still substantially less likely than men to be promoted. The average time to promotion is 6.5 years for women versus five for men. And that obviously has an impact on career earning potential. And then women are significantly less likely to be asked to serve in leadership roles, despite no difference in the aspirations to hold those leadership positions. And this may have to do with implicit bias. So women of backgrounds of, in underrepresented in medicine are also particularly affected by this disparity. So please keep that in mind. And in our specialty in sexual medicine and men's health, we obviously have close relationships with the industry. So how does this play out in, in terms of gender dynamics? This was a study from 2020 that looked at over 12,000 urologists that were receiving industry payments for a period of four years. And they noted that 90% of the physicians receiving payments were male. While there was a greater proportion of increase in female urology payments, um, the average payment amount only increased by 14% for women compared to over 100% for men. So we are seeing industry payments increase for women, but they're increasing at a much higher pace for men. So what drives this gender pay disparity? Many of the things we discussed are already factors, including more academic medicine, greater time spent in research, greater time um, doing non-renumerative clinical responsibilities, and perhaps due to weaker bargaining posture that's influenced by cultural bias, individual and institutional barriers, and lack of mentorship or sponsorship, which really gets back to the heart of this talk and the heart of what Helen described as the importance of why we're here to discuss mentorship and sponsorship so that we can level out this gap. So key concepts for achieving gender equity. Awareness being number one, we need to talk about this. I'm glad you're all here to learn about this because it is a routinely um, perceived gender barrier um, by many women in the field. And it's important that we all learn about this and distribute information. And of course, mentorship and sponsorship. These pertain to learning and being sponsored in salary and benefit negotiation, promotion, leadership opportunities at your institution or hospital, speaking opportunities at the national level or regional level. I also think that in order to achieve gender equity, uh, we all need to demand transparent and objective compensation plans from our, our um, hospital organizations or organizations. We should demand blinded manuscript and grant review as well as hiring and promotion practices. And then of course, for us specifically in the field of sexual medicine, leveraging industry relationships and also seeking transparency and equity from them. So thank you so much for listening to sort of the background on where we are today and where we can go in the future. And we're here for questions, thank you. Sharita, I'll have you go next. There we go. Can you see my slides? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. We see the, uh, Shreda, sorry, we see the. Uh... You see everything? Yeah. Oh, you see the behind the scenes? We don't want that. Okay. Let's get out of there. There we go. All right. Perfect. So, 
Um, I was, hi, my name is uh, Sharita King. I was tasked with going through the barriers and obstacles that we face with mentoring culture. So disclosures, I have none related to this discussion other than I'm a woman and my pronouns are she and her. All right, so the first article that I found um, was from Cross et al. And they talked about the benefits, barriers, and enablers for mentoring females in academics. Um, but we're going to focus on those barriers. So this is one of the, um, the tables that they had in their, their uh, paper. And what they discussed mainly was professional and relational dynamics and also organizational factors that led to these barriers. So um, when you're looking at professional and relational dynamics, there's a bunch of different things that kind of play into this. One is being variable quality of available mentors, um, not being able to get assigned with mentors that kind of match up with you. Then another huge issue is, as we as uh, Mara had discussed, was that there's a lower status in um, profile of, of female academics. When you add this to needing to align with personal factors, and adding that you need to have a good match, this limited the access that female faculty had to quality mentors. Another issue was that many women found that it was difficult and time consuming to find a suitable mentor because of all these barriers. Some men who were mentoring women said that it, they um, had difficulty giving criticism to women. Another thing is that um, all these things are compounded for some women because of age, gender, cultural differences, past experience, and some fluctuating needs for mentorship. Some more um, things that kind of fall into this category is that when you have traditional hierarchical mentoring, it creates a power differential, which can lead to exploitation of mentees. Another problem is that inappropriate mentor behavior can negatively impact mentees' mental, mental health and well-being. Um, another thing that can happen is with top-down approach mentoring, um, without considering personal, cultural, and relational factors, there, it can be perceived as counterproductive. However, when you have choice, facilitated, peer, collaborative, and collegial mentoring, this actually was seen as positive and it alleviated power, vulnerability, and exploitation. So some of the organizational factors that they found were, there's a lot of lack of things. So that would be lack of mentoring women, um, av mentoring available to women, lack of senior women available to mentor, lack of mentors with specific expertise, um, such as different research that you're interested in, shortage of mentors that have um, mutual interests, um, the lack of time in order to do um, these activities because you already feel like you're so busy and overextended. And then on top of that, um, there's not a lot of willingness sometimes to assist uh, less experienced um, staff because there's no institutional support. They don't place value on mentoring. You're worried about your performance, expe performance expectations and promotion criteria. And then also, again, there's no incentives to do this because that you don't have the dedicated time or the buy down for um, this mentoring. So when you're looking at our um, group, SMSNA, so I got these from um, Helen. Uh, if you looked at, look at this, this is just showing the breakdown of female membership within the different categories of members within SMSNA. And as you can see, we are far lower than our male counterparts. Now, the tide is changing in our medical student and resident members um, as the number of um, female graduates from medical school is starting to increase. But on a total, we have 246 women compared to 769 men within SMSNA. So what does that do for mentorship? You know, it's human nature to want to have a mentor, a mentee that looks like you. However, in groups like ours, we don't really have that um, availability sometimes. So you have to look at cross-gender mentorship. And with that, I know it's, it's not what some people see, that, see as ideal, but having that diversity, just like having diversity in any other setting, it can um, increase the potential gain that you can get from this relationship. So I know it's been ingrained in us that, you know, women are from Mars, I'm sorry, men are from Mars and women are from Venus and that we can't commingle, but we are not these mythical characters that can't get together and be able to do cross-gender um, mentorship. 
So this is an interesting article that I found in a Harvard Business Review. And basically what they're saying is that mentoring women doesn't necessarily mean that we are, that we need to have a hero, that we need to be saving or rescued. So what they found in, or discussed in this article was that, you know, male uh, mentors sponsoring, um, male mentors and sponsorship is uh, essential for advancing talented women. They also discussed that the traditional mentor mentee hierarchy may be antiquated and it tends to lead to senior men who are mentoring junior women to feel like they had to save these women. And what they discussed was trying a reciprocal mentoring where both um, the mentor and mentee kind of learn from each other. And it is found that these are more rewarding relationships for both parties. So what is required to have reciprocal mentoring? You need to have mutual listening and affirmation humility, shared power, and extended range of an extended range of mentoring outcomes. So I found this um, chapter from a book. It was written by um, Bill Raggins. And what she discussed in here is mentorship that had the greatest lifelong impact were ones that were more mutual and had greater fluidity in the expertise between the members. Um, the other thing is that mentors, e even though by definition, mentors have more experience in the profession, mentees do bring their own insights, life experiences, and talents to the table. And a good, good mentor will value this and, are, and can be influenced by their mentee's perspective. Another um, article that I found by Jennifer DeVries um, stated that when male allies and mentors act as historic, um, sorry, heroic res rescuers, this strengthens the gendered status quo by reinforcing the male positional power and framing women as being ill-prepared Ill for um, serious leadership roles. So in the words of the great late uh, Tina Turner, we don't need another hero. So another thing that could be a barrier is the Me Too movement. The first thing the Me Too movement did was it shined a light on the prevalence of um, sexual harassment in our society. However, some men begin to feel that it isn't safe to mentor women. And then, as I just stated, some men felt like they needed to save women. So it kind of made a weird dynamic when women needed to go to these men to ask to be their mentor. So in um, these two articles, one being from JAMA, one being from New England Journal of Medicine, they kind of looked into this. And the main thing was that most men just fear uh, being stigmatized as being part of the harassment culture. So even though this is a mentorship and this is the reality, unfortunately for some people, perception is reality. And that's what people fear. However, I feel like it was stated best by Dr. Pisani in an op-ed on Doximity, where she said, denying women access to mentorship and sponsorship will perpetuate the gender gap, which needs to be closed. And there is concern um, that, though, sorry, there is concern that being afraid to mentor women is not only about fearing false accusation of sexual misconduct, but also about uh, discrediting the women who speak out against harassment. So it's important to remember that when we have these biases. So we're at a crossroads in our society where we're either gonna continue to separate men and women, or we're gonna figure out a way that we can um, work together and have cross-gender um, mentorship. And ultimately in any mentoring program, um, for women, they must address the org organizational and cultural change to exact more change than just putting women um, up on a pedestal. So I would like to end with this quote. This is Shirley Chisholm, and she famously said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, then bring a folding chair, and I live by this. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time. And these are just, uh, this is a picture of a few of my mentees. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. King. And uh, Rhonda, we'll have you go next. All right. And then let me do my... All 
All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Bernie, for the opportunity, and uh, and thank you for uh, having me join this uh, this webinar. When uh, Dr. Bernie first asked me to join, I first was pretty hesitant, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm very happy to have had this opportunity, and and I'm happy to spot speak about uh, sponsorship, mentorship, something that was recognized by the AUA this year, uh, specifically in the Gold Sister Scope. Sometimes it often goes unnoticed. Um, it doesn't have RBUs, it doesn't have a dollar value associated with it, uh, but I think a lot of us in academic medicine value this um, and, and want to do this, and I think it's just important uh, for us to find uh, mentorship no matter which uh, part of uh, career we are in. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few things today. We're going to talk about how to find a right mentor, what successful mentorship looks like, what longitudinal mentoring is. There's no like finite time at which you get done with the relationship. It, it, the, the relationship continues to change with time, but but how does it change? Uh, the importance of allyship, and certainly uh, there's a lot of industry support and and backing behind uh, what we do for mentorship these days. So happy to cover a few of these topics in the next uh, ten minutes. I think we spoke about a lot of this. Mentorship has often been thought as 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 a dyad and it's and unidirectional, but I think times are changing. Uh, Dr. King. Uh, described this very well as this uh, mentee can also provide value back to the mentor. And this is a dynamic, it's a reciprocal relationship. And I think people who often think mentor tells the mentee to do things, mentee goes and does task, mentor gives feedback, mentor gives another task, mentee goes and does the work, mentor gives feedback, positive and negative. I think, I think that sort of relationship used to exist uh, many years ago, but I think now uh, it's certainly changed, uh, um, and it's changing as we speak, where this is a bi-directional reciprocal relationship. Uh, mentorship is very important. Only 60% of urology residency programs in the United States actually have some sort of formal mentoring program. Uh, and I think Dr. Heeman uh, discussed this very well. Mentorship has shown to improve career satisfaction, decrease burnout, decrease stress, uh, and definitely increase in academic productivity. So how do we go about finding the right mentor? Everybody comes and asks me, okay, fine. Yes, I know we have to find a good mentor, but how do we actually now go about finding uh, the right mentor? Um, I think it's important to understand as a mentee, what is your, uh, what are your goals? What do you want to do long-term? You wanna get, if you're a resident, you wanna get into a fellowship. If you're a fellow, you're trying to find a job. If you're trying to find a job, you wanna go into private practice, you wanna go into academics. Um, do you want pure clinical focus? Do you want to do academic research? What does that research look like? Do you want to teach? Um, and I think you want to understand all of these goals. Don't just be like, oh, let me go find a mentor and hope they can, he or she can help me. But I think it's important to understand, uh, to figure out what your goals are and try and align that with someone who's doing that. Let me go, if you want to go into private practice, go find a private practice urologist that has crushed it or continues to crush it and go ask them how they do it. And they help you get along um, and, and learn some of the uh, ways in which they do this. And I think as, as, as many goals between the mentor and the mentee are aligned, I think more synchrony, more harmony will be there and more successful the relationship uh, will be there. People often think they need to look very far and wide uh, for mentorship. Uh, you know, people from Washington, Seattle email me and say, hey, can you uh, mentor me? I'm like, no, you've got people around you. Uh, that can actually help you, people from Arizona, anywhere. Look around you, you actually do have a network, whether you like it or not. Um, and I think it's important to understand people often, and I think we talked about this earlier uh, in the webinar, uh, Dr. Bernie discussed this. We don't always need, this doesn't need to be hierarchical. If you're a resident, don't look up to fellows for mentoring. If you're a fellow, don't always look up to attendings for mentoring. Lateral mentoring, that can be co-fellows, either uh, within your institution or even uh, within the same specialty uh, around the country that can help you. And so do the research, figure out who can help you. And you don't necessarily need to have one mentor. There's different mentors that can happen, uh, one for uh, helping you with your um, family situation, one to help you with your relationship, one to help you with your academic career, even within academics and, and, and work, one to help you with your research, one to help you with your clinical focus. So you could certainly have more than one mentor and, and just remember that it always doesn't have to be just one person and there's different people who can help you and you got to look around uh, as to what different people can help you. I will not belabor on this slide. I think Dr. Bernie discussed this very well 
it's very important to understand the difference between the three. Often as residents, as medical students, we often think all of these things are the same thing uh, in our lives. A coach is someone who actually just teaches you skills. You'll have a lot of coaches in life. If you're a urology resident, you'll have 15 attendings teach you something, uh, some operation on how to do, how to manage a patient, how to speak to a patient. And these are all coaches. And you'll have a lot of coaches in life. If you're a medical student, you'll have a lot of teachers teaching you different things, small group leaders teaching you different things. You'll have a lot of coaches. If you're a basic science researcher, you'll have a lot of PhDs, uh, postdocs who are, um, and, and researchers teach you how to do certain techniques. These are all coaches. Don't get them confused with mentors. Everybody that teaches you how to do good surgery, how to uh, properly manage a patient, doesn't automatically become a, a mentor as well. They can play the same role, but more often than not, coaches should remain coaches, and you can't always confuse the roles between uh, coaching and mentoring. Mentor, I think we all know. Sponsor, big difference between sponsor and mentor. A sponsor talks about, about you when you're not there. A mentor talks with you when you are there. And I think that's just very, very important to understand. A mentor knows all of your pluses and minuses in life. A sponsor does not necessarily need to know all of your minuses. A chair in your department is a sponsor. Head of the AUA, the head of the SMSNA is a sponsor. They need to know about your positive aspects and your positive facets. So they remember you when conversations come up where they could put you up for board positions, put you up for general editorial board positions and so on, uh, committee positions and so on. So Sponsors need to talk about you when you're not there. Mentors need to talk with you when you are there and discuss both your positives and your negatives. And I think just as long as you understand the difference between these three different roles, you'll be able to figure out who plays these different roles in your lives. Very rarely people play all three roles, very, very rare, but most people can play one or two roles at a time and just remember what roles each person plays. How do you actually have a successful uh, mentorship? And I think people often ask me, uh, Ranjit, how do you have so many people uh, that you're helping with? How, many, how do you have such a big team? And, and I think uh, one um, strategy is to always uh, be available and be accessible. Sometimes I ask myself if I'm overdoing it and this takes away a little bit from my uh, own family time, but uh, I feel like this all balances out because at work too, sometimes I'm, I'm taking care of, uh, of, of home stuff. So important to understand, um, I, people contact me through WhatsApp, through Facebook message, through Twitter DMs, through direct text messaging, through email, through call. And, and I don't always have one mode of communication, one time in which they can talk to me. If they have a question, they always can ask me anytime that they want. Um, and I will obviously get back to them anytime that I'm available, but it's usually pretty quick, but there's no stringent rules of uh, communication on when to do it uh, and how to do it. And, and I think it's just important to understand that that is probably the biggest secret to success because mentees often expect things to, uh, to get answers right away. And if they don't get the answers right away, they often go on to something else um, and, 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 and the project just sits there and, and does not get done on time. We talked a little bit about longitudinal mentoring. I think this is just the most important uh, that uh, different people are in uh, de require different guidance. Residents at PGY1 level require completely different mentoring compared to somebody at the PGY3 level. Completely different goals compared to a PGY5 chief, chief resident level. Fellows need different mentoring. Young early career faculty need different mentoring. And I think it's just important that, that this relationship needs to continue. And, and, and what gets mentored, what gets conveyed at every stage in one's career has to also keep evolving based on the needs of the mentee. And, I, and often people think that it's the same advice that you keep giving again and again, why am I calling Ranjit? Because he's gonna tell me the same thing again. No, it'll be different based on what the needs are and, and what the career states that, uh, that people are at. And I think that also needs to be understood uh, that this is a uh, longitudinal, long-term relationship and ever-changing relationship. We talked about how this relationship of mentor-mentee is definitely a dyad and it's reciprocal and bi-directional. And I think the, one of the biggest thing that I, can, um, that, I can, that I can convey to everybody here is that mentees can also become their own mentors. And I've realized that as, as, I, as we've grown a team uh, here at the University of Miami, uh, we basically assigned roles to different people to be mentors on their own. This is impossible for me uh, to help as many people as I can uh, directly all the time. And both fellows, um, medical students, 
medical student service mentors. And I think the sort of non-hierarchical team structure, I think is probably a big secret to uh, being academically productive, being productive both on the research as well as on the clinical side, where mentees play mentor roles and, and there's not a true hierarchical structure. If you're a fellow, you gotta listen to uh, the, the, give instructions to the resident. If you're a resident, residents give instructions to students. If you're a student, you give instructions to M, M4 to M3. It, it does not go like that. It, it can, again, bi-directional, reciprocal. Whoever knows more is able to help the person regardless of what uh, career uh, path and, and, and track they are in. And basically this is what led to uh, the importance of, of, of being an ally. And I think this is uh, something that is purposeful uh, that we have been able to do at the University of Miami. Why do we need to be uh, allies? Very nice study that um, Aaron Goraya did. He's a medical student here. He's going to Cornell this year for residency. Got published in the Gold Journal this year. Uh, female trainees are actually twice as high uh, to, to quit residency compared to, to men. And if you are an uh, underrepresented minority, there's a 125% increased chance of, of quitting residency compared to those who are not. And I think this is a big problem. And if we, if we not just support people uh, to get into residency and just leave them, um, I think that's not good because this is where longitudinal mentoring comes in, relationship building comes in, and, and we need to make sure that we support uh, residents uh, who enter programs, uh, not just at the entry level, but throughout their residency to make sure that they uh, succeed both in residency programs and going on to find uh, fellowships and jobs. How can we support them? Uh, beautiful study, Camilla Suarez is an incoming uh, urology intern here at the University of Miami, has worked with us for the last uh, uh, two years, basically said there's, there's not enough support uh, for female authors to be uh, first authors. Huge study basically that showed that uh, most of the uh, female authors are somewhere in the middle and, and not as much representation to become first authors and or last authors. So really has to be purposeful, um, really has to uh, be a conscious effort. It just cannot be, uh, I am supporting, it just cannot be just all the talk uh, without walking the walk. So what does it uh, look like to be uh, an ally? So here at the University of Miami, uh, we started a program called the Miami Andrology Research Scholar Program. So. Uh, this is a program for uh, medical students. It is financially supported uh, for women and underrepresented minorities to basically take a year off in urology um, and spend a year doing uh, clinical research, clinical trials, and basic or translation research with us. Uh, and we've been uh, pretty successful so far. Uh, Farah, Catherine, um, and uh, Brian and Marco uh, were scholars this year. Uh, Paris Diaz was a scholar last year along with Alexandra. So we've, we've, we've now made a very conscious effort. I think one of the uh, few of the incoming scholars this year are also on the call, uh, Amara, Alex, and, and David Velasquez. So really this has to be a, a conscious effort. This cannot just be um, I support, I support, and, and not make uh, a, a significant uh, effort and, and a contribution. Very happy that industry has uh, gotten behind this and, and supporting this very well. Um, uh, Helen Burney was able to uh, use the uh, help of a, a sponsorship program to come visit us at the University of Miami. And, and we've now set up mentoring calls on a regular basis and, and, and helping her uh, through her career. Um, Denise Safu, I think, is also on the call, uh, was, uh, an import, was a USMART mentee uh, last year. We still uh, stay in touch, uh, supported by the AUA. So I think uh, both Boston Scientific and Coloplast and, and Endo have been uh, making a conscious effort, uh, at least to support SMSNA, to support programs uh, that will uh, create sustainable change uh, that is much, much needed uh, for us uh, in this at this time. So really, and, and I think this is tangential uh, benefits for one sponsored program. Helen was able to come and influence our mentees, and they've gone on to sort of uh, become uh, her mentees and sort of ask her for career advice. Uh, and I think uh, even those small changes that we do, small efforts that we do, uh, can multiply and, and, and be more productive than what we initially think. So really, I think as uh, for men that want to sort of support this and get behind this, it has to be a conscious effort. It has to be uh, an institutional effort. It has to be a sustainable change. Uh, it cannot just be um, um, changes that, are, that, that, that cannot be implemented right away. So what can... Um, 88% of urologists who are male do. I think, I think this is an important slide where 
we need we do need to sponsor and mentor women. This is this is our chance to basically diversify the field. We got to promote them. We got to make sure that they get uh, visibility, recognition, both at the national as well as the international stage. We have to address the disparities. I think all all three of them who spoke today really said that we are at a, a crossroads where there is disparity. Uh, it is not equitable. And, and I think we just need to make sure that we uh, create not just a welcoming environment, but also create, uh, appreciate spaces such as SWU that's uh, supportive of these efforts um, and, and get behind this effort. So really uh, thank everybody for this opportunity and, and thanks Dr. Bernie and the SMSNA for this opportunity and really happy to take uh, any questions as a panel at the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramasamy and Dr. Heyman and Dr. King. This was fantastic. Um, we'll certainly open it up to the, the floor for anyone to ask any questions. I've had a personal, a couple of few messages sent to me as well. I think, you know, one of the things that's, that is kind of always on the question of everyone is, how do you get more men involved, right? Like I see how many guys are right now on our webinar that have logged in and like, great job to you guys. Um, you know, coming out here and looking at this because together we all achieve more, you know, when there's, there's always room at the table. So what is it that we can do to get these men that maybe aren't on right now tonight, or that maybe are in these leadership roles that are choosing who are the speakers, who are panelists, who are, the, how do we encourage them and, and promote them to really build and, and kind of sponsor women? If that's something that, you know, in the past, isn't something they've been doing traditionally. And I'll kind of let that for either one of you or, or all three of you can maybe comment on what your thoughts are on that? I'll go ahead and dive in. Um, I think for me, some of my experiences just show me that showing up, being present, um, doing the work to be an expert in the field and uh, take great care of patients and also have conversations and be confident in yourself. Um, has really shown me a turning point in some of our male colleagues who may not have had those similar relationships with women in the field and, and known that we can also be experts at, at men's health. And so I personally have seen kind of a transition in a few of my male colleagues who may not have had those kind of relationships of, of mentor or friend in the field where because I sit down with them at dinner and talk about difficult cases and talk about the challenges I've had or the successes I've had, they now see me as an equal and someone that they can sort of send their cool surgery pictures to because they're proud of themselves. So I think it's really just showing up confidence and asking questions um, and really like, like Shirley Chisholm said, just bring a folding chair. If you're, if there's no seat at the table, it's, it's time to still show up. That's great. Yeah. But yeah, so I would just agree with everything um, that Mara just said. So I, um, like I said, that, that's why I put that Shirley Chisholm quote in there. It's on my wall in my um, office. Like I've, I've always been that person. Like you, you don't have to invite me. I'm coming regardless. So either you take me as a mentor uh, as our mentee and then also like now becoming an associate professor. Now I'm moving up in the ranks and looking back. So um, I think Amy asked about like, how do you, mentor um like male counterparts I, I think you just approach it in the same way in in the research that I was doing for my part the main thing that people wanted was just somebody that's open and honest with them that's not gonna like act like if they ask a question that that's an that's like a stupid question um and that that's a big thing I think is a problem in medicine is that we always look at people like why did you ask that or like and it ingrains a fear in a lot of people that they don't want to ask these questions so they fear having these mentor relationship. So just being open and honest, that's the best way for any mentorship, menteeship to go back and forth either way. I think that's a great question that Amy Perlman um, from Miami asked about how can you discuss your experiences as women mentoring male trainees and any differences? And, you know, I think from a standpoint of me, I think being a role model and and walking the talk, like Dr. Ramasamy said, you know, if you're in a position where you can put them on a panel, that you can put them on a speaking event, if you're you can get them in a research project involving them, doing exactly what 
you want done for you or what you want done for the female mentors, mentees, um, you know, I think is one of the biggest things there. Um, I'm lucky that I'm at an institution where we have a really good supportive environment. My husband is a urologist and he's also there and he's really become one of the biggest allies for us because, you know, one of the points that, uh, you know, Dr. Ramasamy brought up and Dr. Heyman too, was that a lot of times people think uh, that they're doing it. You know, that, oh, I, I'm supporting women. I, I I like women. But that goes back to that point that women have mentors, but those mentors aren't sponsors. They're not talking about it behind their back. They're not putting them on projects. They're not bringing them to the table. They're they're giving them good advice. But without that sponsorship component, it's, it's impossible for anyone. No matter how great you are, it's going to make it such an uphill battle. Not to say we can't do it. We got women right here on the stage. But you need that sponsorship and you need to find people who will do that for you if you don't have someone that'll do that. But my husband has really been an ally because he initially thought, yeah, I, I see this too. And then being at an institution where he could see how there were differences and how he was, uh, something was handled with him versus something handled with me or differences and um, opportunities that would present themselves. Um, it really opened his eyes. And now he's really been that person that goes to bat and he has meetings in his office talking about females in the workplace and other biases that he can help control kind of as like his kind of head office manager person. So um, I think that this is this is a really good good role role modeling standpoint of how you want to do it because then you're training them you're showing them how to act to other mentees as they progress in the field um, you know and showing them that this isn't an old relationship where it was I'm going to scut you out and give you all this work to do and then um, you know have all my names on these papers and then I'm not even going to act like I know you at a conference or walk to you you know we're building relationships these are long lasting relationships and we're changing the dynamic of medicine here so um, you know I think there was another great question by Dr. Ari Bernstein as we embark on visiting sub ICs in the summer you know what advice do you have for male residents and male heavy residency programs of how they can make the environment more comfortable in terms of mentorship for rotating female students Dr. Ramasamy, do you want to try that one? I think the whole concept of um, this is male, this is female, I'm going to treat them differently. Um, you know, oh my gosh, so sorry, you're coming into a male dominated residency program. Let me make you feel better by being, you know, I think if you set up all of these things, the medical student is going to feel weird. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, I did not notice this, but thank you for bringing it to my attention. <laughs> How I will be very cognizant that I'm surrounded by women, by all men, and maybe I should be behaving differently because suddenly now I'm thrown in an environment from medical school, which is predominantly female. We've known class after class that are more women that go into medical school than men, uh, that now I have to feel different. I think just, just to not make that observation and treat them all as equal, give them projects, send them to cases, whatever it is that, 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 that you would do for male medical students, do that for female medical students and you don't have this conscious thought process to distinguish the two, I think you'll just do fine. I think that's great. I think, you know, another thing too, and I'm, I'll let you speak too, Dr. Hammond, is when you're doing things, I know most of the time residents always want to make it fun and maybe invite some of your sub eyes to go do some outside of work activities because you're really trying to get to know them of like, are they going to be a good fit here? Pick activities that are gender neutral right? Like I, I'm going to use golf as the example, because I don't golf, even though I know many women golf and love it. But if maybe those sub eyes don't golf, don't make it a guy's golfing trip, you know, that you're going to go do on a weekend, do something where you can really get to know the residents. That's going to be a gender neutral event too. So Dr. Heyman, were you going to speak? Yeah, I would just say that, um, I totally agree with that. Um, Ranjith and Helen, um, I think that, uh, making group for those social activities, making it a group event, um, is obviously a way to not have it feel sort of like that perception versus reality slide that Sharita had. Um, I think that also asking your program to have a formalized mentoring, it doesn't really have to be like a gigantic structured um, mentorship situation, but just to, to label it as a mentoring program to allow those relationships to really take off. And obviously some residents have more interest in sort of teaching and shepherding juniors through or med students through, um, and they can sign up as mentors. And then it's sort of like a nice uh, feather in your cap and more of a formalized um, relationship. Excellent, excellent. Um, and there was another one kind of bouncing off of uh, Ari's from Justin Lulai. 
you know, he just said, just again, what can, and he said other suggestions on how male residents can make female co-residents feel best supported during a rigorous residency. Um, is anything else you guys want to add on that? I know we kind of mentioned some of the things. I've had female residents who've gotten pregnant during the course of the residency. People who have female residents who are breastfeeding. Um, you just got to be cognizant and, and just think, and I, and I always think, I'm like, what did I do when my wife was you know, pregnant when and and what or all what all leniencies did we do and and just be accommodating, right? If a female resident wants to pump in the middle of a robot case, yeah, just go relieve her. You know, yes, you're post call, but go relieve her. Make sure this is not like a guilt trip. Oh my gosh, I have to ask someone to relieve me of my coverage so I can, uh, you know, pump milk for my daughter. I mean, you know, don't don't make that a a a, a guilty feeling. Just make this normal. Make these conversations. Um, that that you can have it in residency without ever having to be like, oh my gosh, if I ask this, are they going to ask me to stay extra late today in the case because I asked this male resident to come and cover me during this long five hour cystectomy? Or should I not do the cystectomy because I need to pump? So should I do these small cases and never be able to do these long cases and I'll do them later? I think all of these need to become part of normal conversations. Um, nobody should feel guilty for asking. Male residents should feel completely okay to, to cover uh, because they need to realize they're going to have this in their own families where they're going to ask, uh, you know, they're going to ask for help and, and, and they should all just become uh, normal routine and not a special situation, special permission. We need to ask X, Y, and Z to be able to be able to do that. Now, that's really great because there's so many more women now having children in residency. I know I had a kid in residency too. Um, you know, another thing that I think that a lot of you male residents and male fellows may not even recognize and attendings is, is calling out someone, right? That loud sponsorship. So when you're in a room or maybe, maybe someone shared, maybe Dr. Heyman shared an article with me that was really helpful and it was really interesting. And now I'm hanging out with my chairman and I'm talking about something, bring it up. You know, Dr. Mara Heyman, she gave me this great reference for this. And I was thinking maybe we could do this using that name, giving them credit where they're doing that, speaking behind their back, you know, in a positive way is another way to really elevate females in your program and, and show that, hey, wow, they're really contributing. They're really being a team player. You know, it's it's the speaking when you didn't have to, when you could maybe take credit for that idea or that that uh, task that you're doing, but you let someone know that, that you were helped. There, there was someone else that had a great idea, someone else that did something that was outstanding, that kind of stood a, ahead of the rest. So, I think that we kind of forget all of us how you can really do that, both women too, to other women, how you can sponsor and you can be like, hey, you know, she's a great speaker. You know, thanks so much for asking me to do this, but I think we should have her on this too, or at least let's do something where we can add her on this program because she's got a lot of value. And she gave a great talk last week at this or X, Y, Z. So it's really bringing that up and bringing that to the table. Um, I have another question, and this was a really good one that was uh, sent to me. So it's felt at when you're interviewing for fellowships, which I'll be doing this year, um, how do you know which fellowship directors are going to be those lifelong mentors and sponsors versus someone that's not? How can I help use that to help me choose a good fellowship? I can answer that. I think just history, you know, have they asked, speak with the previous fellows? Have they, have they stayed in touch with you or have they gone dark after you finish fellowship? Are they still continuing to support you? I've actually now realized that fellows actually need more help after they finish fellowship than during fellowship. Coaching them during fellowship is actually the easy part. Finishing fellowship and staying in touch with them, supporting them, supporting their careers, giving them opportunities, that's the hard part. That's when the actual support begins. So yes, please speak to the former fellows. Are, is your fellowship mentor still in touch with you? Are they helping you with your career? Have you called them back for difficult cases, things that you've wanted to do in your career? Are they being supportive? Do they pick up the call? Do they, are they still accessible after you finish the fellowship or are they dead to you after you finish fellowship? I think if you answer those questions, that those, those will become very apparent. Dr. Heyman, did you want to add? No, I was going to let Sharita, if you had some advice there. Yeah, so um, I would say that even, so yes, all that is great advice from, um, from Ranjit, but if, say, if you find yourself in a situation where you get into a fellowship and you don't have a great mentor, right? Um, I was blessed to have a great mentor in mine, but what I also did is I traveled and met with other people and I went to Miami with, um, with Perito. I was in 
Tampa with carry on. And I went, you know, I went to Palm Springs with, um, who was out there at the time? Wilson. So like I, I went around the country and made other people, my mentors, you're just because you have picked a fellowship and you're in it. It doesn't mean you're completely chained to that person forever. Amen. Right. And you can always find more mentors and like uh, Rondi said in his talk, like it's, it's not always just going to be one person. Sometimes you need multiple people out there um, that can kind of fulfill different parts of the mentor mentee um, relationship for you. That's excellent. We have a few more. I want to I want to be uh, respectful of everyone's time, but we have two really good questions. I'm going to try to at least get to one. So how do we ensure that mentorship is standardized at a systemic level, like residency fellowships, so mentors can be compensated and hence pursuing the cycle forward or pushing the cycle forward and ensuring that there's more diverse people that will actually get these opportunities to become mentors? That's a great question. I think that's a great question and sort of what um, part of what I was talking about about the gender pay gap is that there is there is this level of um, dedication to education and mentorship and building these relationships among women that is not compensated. And obviously there are phenomenal mentors like Dr. Ramasamy here um, and you spend so much of your time, you know, coordinating and talking with people and mentoring people. And you're, that's obviously time that's not compensated. The bottom line is at present, it is not. But I think this is really kind of where we all begin to talk about how we um, how we talk with our leadership at our institutions, whether academic or hospital leadership, about these sort of citizenship um, goals and how we get compensated as part of our as part of our sort of citizenship um, package you know that's obviously not gonna um, necessarily improve our productivity from a surgical standpoint but that's a part of good leadership and and it really goes towards your promotion and all of those things so um, you know these are if you can formalize your mentorship if you can get you know um, make this a, you know, a formal educational activity that can go towards your promotion in an academic career at least. Absolutely. And another good point was just that even if you've, you're assigned a mentee or a mentor in your program and it's not a good fit, you can still do the mandatory meeting that you need to, but you can switch and you can change and you can go to your program director and you can talk to them. Um, you know, Dr. Andino brought up that point. So I think that's another good, good kind of point just to bring up for everyone here. Um, I also just lastly want to say that Sometimes, it, you know, from a standpoint of more junior faculty, maybe not residents or even from a residency, your chairman or your program director may not realize all the other stuff that you're doing and the extracurricular things that you're involved in. So bring it up, whether it's on a piece of paper and you, you show it to them at your annual review or your meeting, but let them know all the stuff you're doing. Because a lot of times I, I think women are guilty more so than men of, of not highlighting your accomplishments and what you're doing to really help people start thinking of you more for these positions and spots of like, wow, I didn't realize they were doing all this or look how many papers they've been involved in because you know most, most chairmen are not PubMedding your name and, and seeing how many papers each one of their faculty members have written, right? So um, I just wanna thank all of our panelists who are on tonight. This was fantastic. Um, thank you to all the viewers that stayed on and, and asked all these wonderful questions. Please feel free to reach out to any of us if, if we can be of assistance to you guys. Thank y'all so much for spending your evening with us and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Helen. Thanks to the SMSA. Bye, everybody.